Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our tenant worship together here at Martin Luther this morning. Today is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, and the focus of our worship will be how God works in us in an unseen but powerful way through His Word. We'll be worshiping today using the common service on page 15. However, today we will begin with the baptism, and after our first hymn, we'll be using the order of baptism that's on page 12 in the hymn. We begin by singing hymn 282. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, 
I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation may be seated. <laughs>
may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Augustine is written in Romans chapter 9. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about his concern for his own people. He also shares this truth about the hidden working of God, that God's working in his salvation is not by physical descent, but by trust in his promises, just like Abraham's promised descendants, including the Savior himself, did not come through his first son, but through the son of the promise. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I will return, and Sarah will have a son. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity to the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from the close of today's Gospel from Luke chapter 13, where Jesus says, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? This is God's word, you may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you can trace it back to Adam or to Noah, or in another way of thinking, you can trace it back to Jesus and his disciples. What is it? It's the holy Christian church, all believers, the kingdom of God. And how, who can number their spiritual descendants? I suppose it's a lot like human families, isn't it? Several years ago, we went to a family reunion, my side of the family, the 150th anniversary of Swen and Guri Swenson coming to America. So yes, I am descended from a Swen Swenson and from his son, Swen Swenson Jr. <laughs> and there at the family reunion, there were tables spread out. And on these tables were the chart of descendants of Swen and Guri. And there were thousands of names, over 3,000, I believe, we were told, of their descendants. This is what happens in human families. Most of them live in South Central Minnesota. A few of them got smart after the war and moved up to California. But many, many descendants. How much more are the spiritual descendants of our spiritual ancestors? It's like God said to Abraham that one day, look at the stars in the sky and consider the sand on the seashore. So shall your offspring be. And this is the truth that we're looking at today. God's kingdom grows from one early believer. It grew. The message of salvation in Jesus Christ, revealed as the Savior, started from Him and has expanded all over the world. God's kingdom grows. And it grows on its own power and in an invisible way. Those are the truths that we look at today, these parables that Jesus tells. And when we realize those truths, it affects what we do. It leads us both to humble ourselves and be grateful to, for God's grace to us, and also to trust God's loving power for salvation. The kingdom of God grows on its own power and in an unseen way. Again, Jesus here says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? I suppose we might first of all notice some things that Jesus does not choose to compare his kingdom to. He does not choose to compare his kingdom to an army, powerfully advancing, destroying everything in its path, conquering by force. Jesus does also not choose to compare his kingdom to some strong force of nature, like the wind or the waves, knocking things down, blowing people away, washing them. Now we notice what Jesus did choose. He, he chooses some small things. He chooses some weak things. He chooses some things that are seemingly dead. Mustard seed. Great yeast. Maybe we can think of that mustard seed, first of all, how it illustrates the kingdom of God grows by its own power. A mustard seed is small and insignificant. While there's a little bit of debate over what plant exactly Jesus was speaking about here, we can probably think of that mustard seed if you have a jar of brown mustard that has whole seeds in there. They're pretty small. They're pretty tiny. They're insignificant. But yet, what is true about those seeds? They contain all the material and all the information that is needed to produce a much larger plant. Put that seed that looks dead into the ground, and what happens? Add some water and some time. And it sprouts, and it grows. And it knows what to do because of the DNA that is there. God has packed a powerful amount of information into that little tiny seed. And that's the first point of Jesus' parables here today. That the kingdom of God, although it might seem like a small or unseen thing, it grows into something big all on its own power. Just like that mustard seed when the plant grows into the plant that becomes and produces more, it produces more seeds. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any mustard. So, what's the application for us in knowing that the kingdom of God grows all on its own power? 
Well, maybe sometimes we'd like, or would like, to be able to see a kingdom that grows by our own efforts. Maybe sometimes Christians are infected by the feeling of a need that God's kingdom must grow, otherwise we're doing something wrong. Now you might say, wait a second, don't we want God's kingdom to grow? The answer is yes, we do. God wants his kingdom to grow, we want his kingdom to grow. And so this is one of those kind of half-truths, isn't it? God wants his kingdom to grow, and it does grow. But yet, God never says that you have the power yourself to make his kingdom grow. If we would think that it was up to us, all up to us, and it was by our power, then, then what would the results be? What would we do? I suppose one result is that we would use every kind of psychological manipulation we could think of to try to convince people and argue with them that you really should believe in Jesus because it would be up to us to make that case and try to prove it to people. And if we were successful, where would we give the credit? We would give the credit to ourselves. But we'd be mistaken. We'd be mistaken because only God can change hearts that are completely opposed to Him and turn those into the hearts that love Him. There's a truth of the Bible that we never want to overlook, that by nature we are dead in our sins. And we cannot bring ourselves back to life. Only God can do it. How does He do it? He does it through the message of salvation. He does it through the waters of baptism that apply that message. He does it through the message that we hear and encourage us each and every day. Because just look at how God's kingdom came to you and me. It came, yes, through human actions, through hands applying law, through voices speaking words. But God is the cause of what happened there. There's a difference between the means and the cause behind those means. God works through the means of His words and His Spirit causes us to become alive. His Spirit causes our spirit to grow. And you know what that gives us? That gives us confidence. Because if we thought that our salvation and the growth of the Christian church depended on our efforts, then what would we do if we saw those efforts fail? What would we do in those times of question? We would have no hope. But because our salvation and the working of God's kingdom depends on Him, doesn't that give us confidence? It gives us confidence to know that our salvation does not depend on us, but on God. And God's kingdom work does not depend on us, but on God. And therefore, we do what we do. We worship the way that we worship. We gather around the message. We gather around the water. We gather around the bread and wine. And we receive these blessings of our Lord for our faith and salvation. We humble ourselves. We're grateful for God's grace, trusting that God's kingdom grows all by His own power. God's kingdom also grows in an unseen way. At the beginning of our gospel, it told how Jesus had healed a woman who had been crippled for 18 years because of the Spirit. He was showing that church is all about healing. He was giving physical healing, just as we come to church for spiritual healing. Well, how did the synagogue ruler respond? He says, it's, it's against the rules. There are six days for people to work, and if Jesus is going to be doing some work, he should do it on one of those six days. So if you want to be healed, come on one of those six days. Don't come to church on the Sabbath, that day of rest. But is that what God's kingdom is all about? Is God's kingdom a kingdom of external rules? Or is it something on the inside? Isn't God's kingdom more of not a place for perfect people, but a hospital where people come to be healed by their Savior, Jesus? And this is, is where Jesus uses the illustration of, of the yeast to, see, uh, to show us how God's kingdom comes in an unseen way. Think of yeast. Kind of get in the jar at the store, that jar that seems a little more expensive each week, but yet it contains something valuable, doesn't it? It contains that wheat that makes flour rise and produce bread. Otherwise, we just have crackers. That yeast is so small, it seems like it's dead. 
but put it into the dough, warm it up, add some food for it to eat, and it grows and produces results. It, it's something that's happening. We can't see it with our naked eye except in the overall results of bread rising, that chemical reaction that's taking place, but, but yet it's there. The kingdom of God, too, it comes in an unseen way. It starts as something small. It grows into something big, all the way that we cannot see, just as that yeast works throughout the dough to produce a loaf of wonderfully tasting bread. Would we sometimes like a kingdom that is seen, a kingdom that goes by the rules? Would we like God's kingdom to be a kingdom of, of decent people, good church people? Well, if it were, there would be a little bit of a problem, right? Because who really is a decent person before our holy God? We have sinned in our thoughts, we have sinned in our words, we have sinned in our actions. And so if God was going to return to earth and summon to himself all the decent, perfect people on the earth, he would find no one. No one except one, except Jesus our Savior. The one who lived in a perfect way, the one who died for everyone who did it. He is our hope, he is our salvation, he is the one that we can claim. He has satisfied all of God's rules. He is the Savior that we need. And as members of God's kingdom, we are people who have and who know that Savior. And then what can we do? We can trust. We can trust God's loving power for our salvation because the kingdom of God works not in a way that we can touch the hand, but in a way that is unseen by the trust that God gives us in Jesus for salvation. What does all of this show? All of this shows God is at work. God is active. Jesus is not dead and gone. Jesus is alive and living and ruling forever. And he makes his kingdom grow. So we don't try to define some external kingdom based on human rules. We don't worry whether or not God's kingdom is going to grow. We trust that it does. We're pleased when we're a part of it. When we gather around God's word, where he makes us grow. Amen. Please stand. Peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds by faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
and cheerfully give it. Let the example of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf teach us the unselfish love and humble service needed to bring salvation to others. In his name we ask it. Amen. Please stand for prayer. We include in our prayers today the family of our member Randy Seidler, who passed away on Thursday, leaving behind wife Sandy and many children and grandchildren. <coughs> His funeral service, memorial service, will take place Monday, tomorrow evening, 6 p.m. at Seafeld Funeral Chapel in Oshkosh, with a visitation from 3 until 6 p.m. We pray. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us anew each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being, and are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us the Holy Spirit that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith that we might always be ready to do your will. We pray for the nations of the earth, subdue terror and tyranny everywhere, and call forth leaders to acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own men. May it ever follow that which is good, and turn from all that which is wicked, that our people may prosper in uprightness and integrity. Hear, O Lord, our cry for those who are afflicted. Grant them health and body and soul, and save them for your mercy's sake. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Randy Seiler, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought him to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort his family and all who mourn his death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. Through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> On page 21, we continue with the service of the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you.
this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new cup, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all with us.
for he is the
reach for college students that way as well. It's followed at 7 o'clock by a college student in Bible study uh, beginning Thursday, September 10th. Anyone is welcome to the service 6 p.m. Thursday is beginning that week. Uh, choir and handbells are starting up their rehearsals on Wednesday, September 9th, two Wednesdays from now. Uh, choir at 6.30 p.m. and Wednesday's handbells at 7.30. We do need a couple more ringers to have a full handbell choir. If you're uh, interested in that, please come to the rehearsal and talk to Mrs. Erickson. Uh, also, voices are sought for choir. Uh, please come to our rehearsal on Wednesday evening, September 9th. I believe well, one other announcement, we do need a few more helpers for our school library volunteers to help staff during the school day. So if you're someone who has some free time during the school day, I would invite you to check out the sign-up sheet in the extended narthex where there's some more information or talk to Mrs. Berg about the school library that can spare an hour or two during the week. Those are the announcements. May the Lord bless your day and please take a moment to greet someone whom we worship today at this time. Good morning.